Hello AP, 10.7, Kinetic Molecular Theory. Uh, kinetic mole Molecular Theory, you will hear some more of this when we get to Chapter 14, Kinetics. A uh, very important topic that you know how to explain. And I always say it really helps if you can kind of think like a gas. How would a gas behave if you change certain conditions? So this is a big learning target, 3.5. Explain the relationship between the motion of particles and the microscopic prop, uh, properties of gases with kinetic molecular theory. And you can abbreviate it KMT. AP, totally fine with that. A particulate mo model and a graphical representation. And this is big. You're going to see models in the notes, okay, particle molecules. And graphical represent representation, you're going to see at the end of these notes too. And Fairbrows can help us with that. So you have to be able, sorry, I can't write on my chart. You have to be able to not only explain kinetic molecular theory, but using it with diagrams. So kinetic molecular theory relates the macroscopic properties of gases and motion of the particles of the gas. So we're talking about how gases move, and if conditions change, how will that change how the gas moves? There is a huge graph called the Maxwell Boltzmann distribution and this is the graph this one right here I have no clue why my notes do that in the chart uh, this is that graphical representation that you're going to see at the notes describes the distribution of kinetic energies at a certain temperature so if you change temperature you're going to change energy because temperature and kinetic energy very related to each other direct relationship okay you crank up the temperature you're gonna make those gases go faster and if you crank down the temperature if you cool that gas down you're gonna make them go slower so definitely direct relationship are the all the particles in the samples of matter are continuous and random motion which means you can't stop gases from moving unless you get a specific temperature called zero Kelvin so no matter what, all matter is moving. The average kinetic energy of a particle is related to its velocity. And velocity is another way of saying speed. Okay, So we have this equation. Kinetic energy is 1 half mv squared. Okay, And we usually do this, do this equation in another chapter, but I also want you to get some notes down for it. This m has to be, this is mass, has to be in kilograms. And that V, that is velocity, and it will be meters per second, okay? So when we do this calculation, when, like I said, we're not doing the calculation here in this section. We're going to do it in another chapter when it relates to actually calculating the speed of uh, gases and particles. Uh, and it's probably, you're going to see it, like I said, in Chapter 14. The Kelvin temperature of a sample is proportional to the average kinetic energy. And I just said it right there. So if you crank up temperature, you're going to make them move faster. Okay. So faster moving molecules and vice versa. And the Maxwell Boltzmann distribution, and see, they even brought it in twice. A graphical representation of the energies, velocities of the particles. So we're looking at not only different gases but how they move at certain temperatures and how fast they move at that temperature and what's the energy look like for that so first you need to understand what is kinetic molecular theory it's a huge huge theory uh, in not only chemistry but it also brings in physics into this too and as I said, it explains gas behavior. It explains how gases move. Now, unfortunately, it is a theory because there are two conditions in this theory that do have a little bit of conditions that go with it that don't mean the word always. Okay, so let's dive into this. A model that explains real gases approach the behavior of an ideal gas is PV equals NRT. Remember I told you real gases, they all have different properties. And we would have to use hundreds and hundreds of different equations to solve for every gas. But if we say they are ideally behaving as an ideal gas, then we can use one equation. Now there are five conditions that explain 
kinetic molecular theory, it explains the properties of an ideal gas. So we're going to look at all five conditions. Kinetic molecular theory gives us the understanding of pressure and temperature on the molecular level. So if we have a high deal, an ideal gas, we want it to ideally be at very high temperature. And why very high temperature? Because you would have very high energy. And that means you have more motion. You have more motion, probably more collisions. But we would also like it to be under low pressure too. So I'm telling you now, you need to know the difference between an ideal gas and a real gas. And that's the difference right there. High temperature, low pressure for an ideal behaving gas. So the theory is moving molecules. The more that they move, the better. Okay, so we want kinetic molecular theory, that word kinetic, we are looking at movement, motion on the molecular level for gases. So kinetic molecular theory. And like I said, you can abbreviate KMT, but you have to know all five conditions and be able to explain it. So how does connect kinetic molecular theory work with the gas laws that we've, uh, that we've actually looked at in 10.3? So kinetic molecular theory explanations. So when you ask me, well, how do you explain it, Rodriguez? It's uh, literally right here in this box. So Boyle's Law. Boyle's Law looked at how pressure and volume changed as temperature stayed constant, and it had an inverse relationship, which means as one goes up, one goes down. So as the volume of the container decreases, you're actually the particle collisions with the sides of the container more often because you went from a box that was big to a little box and when you change that volume when you decrease it like that you just made the particles closer and when they get closer together they can collide more and that's a good thing we want collisions okay kinetic molecular theory is about collisions the more collisions increase the pressure so that's why if your volume of that container shrinks and it's not the volume of the gas it's the volume of the container okay that's that key part right there the container when the volume shrinks you will actually create more pressure because you have created more collisions that's how Boyle's law works Charles's law looked at how volume and temperature were related and it was a direct relationship as pressure stayed constant so when the temperature increases you are making a move faster and you are not only making a move faster but you are now making stronger collisions and more collisions not only with the gases but with the sides of the container so i'm going to put also with other gases too so the volume increases to keep that constant uh, that constant pressure. So as that temperature increases, your volume will increase too. And because of that volume increasing, you will get more collisions because they are moving faster. And you are going to be increasing that energy because they are moving faster. A lot of direct relationships. Avogadro's is the only one that actually looked at how moles change if volume changes and it kept temperature and pressure constant. So by adding more particles to the container, so if you had one container the same size, okay, maybe had like five particles in it, and you kept the same volume, but you actually have more moles inside of it. The more moles you put in it, the more collisions. I mean, think about it, ladies and gentlemen, if you put more people in a room, it's going to get tight and they're going to bump into each other a lot more than they did in a room that had less people okay so increasing that volume while pressure is constant you can actually increase the amount of moles that you put in that container and as you increase the amount of moles you will get uh, increasing of volume as long as that pressure is constant and Guy Lussac looked at, just like Charles's law, but he looked at pressure and how temperature changes as long as volume stayed constant. So when that temperature increases, you make them move faster, you make them have stronger collisions, and the pressure increases as that volume is constant, 
and temperature is all related to energy. These two go hand in hand. If you change temperature, you change energy. So when you're talking about changing temperature, you always need to mention, you always need to reference how energy is changing. Pressure and volume don't do the changes for energy. They can just make more or less collisions. But the only one that can actually change energy, increase or decrease, is the temperature. So when you're making those references, temperature and kinetic energy, they are very directly related to each other. And that's the only one that you can relate that temperature with is that kinetic energy. Pressure and volume, you've got to direct that with collisions. So to help you in explaining applications to gas laws, okay, so I gave you some scenarios. So what would happen to gases if you increase the volume of the container? A lot of things can happen at constant temperature. So you're looking at about a Boyle's Law scenario here. So what would happen to the gases as temperature stayed constant? Well, according to Boyle's Law, if volume goes up, well, then my pressure should go down. But what else will change? Volume increases at constant temperature. Well, if temperature is constant, kinetic energy stays the same because these two are direct related, not to volume. So if temperature is constant, kinetic energy is constant. And what would happen to the speed? Well, you didn't crank up the temperature, so the speed will also stay constant. So you may be asked to even talk about speed or velocity. The gas molecules uh, have to travel farther. Why do they have to try, travel farther? Because you just put more space in between the gases. And because of that, they have to travel farther to make those collisions. And what happens is, because that pressure decreases, you actually have less collisions because they have to travel farther. And that is how Boyle's Law works. So, ladies and gentlemen, it's not that volume increase and pressure decreases and that's it, end of story. But why does it do that? And this is the explaining part of it. Another scenario is, what if you actually change temperature? So, what if temperature increases but volume stays constant. All right, so this looks like maybe like a Guy Lussac type of scenario. Okay, and as we know at Guy Lussac, if temperature increases, pressure should increase. But if pressure increases, what kind of domino effect did that just happen because you increase temperature and you increase pressure? Well, I know the first thing that's going to do with this guy is kinetic energy. He is definitely going to change. So if temperature increases, your kinetic energy is also going to increase. Okay, You are gaining more energy as that temperature is being increased. And if you're gaining more energy, you're making a move more and you're making a move faster. There's that speed. So they're not only colliding with the gases more, but they're also colliding with the containers. So also uh, other gases. And that's why sometimes they always tell you, do not ever put like an enclosed can in like a microwave or anything like that. So like an aerosol can or like if somebody's trying to heat up that whipped cream that's in a can because it's, you know, maybe it's, it's too cold, it's frozen. Uh, you just lay it out on the counter and let room temperature heat it up. You never put an aerosol can ever in a microwave. Because when you have cranked up that temperature, you have cranked up the molecules and made them move faster. And if a gas is in an enclosed container, it can't escape until it goes kaboom. So that's why you never put anything like that in a microwave. And if the gases are moving faster, we have created more collisions. And the change in momentum in each collision increases. And what happens is, apologies right there, my phone. Uh, the molecules can strike harder. So you're going to start to see diagrams that kind of look like this. How would you actually be able to show, because remember one of the things is that you have to show particle representation. So that's why they're called particle diagrams. And you have seen so many AP questions where they love the pictures. So if this was a gas and he is going this way, and maybe this gas is coming up here, and this gas is going over here. 
and so forth, so forth, so forth. Okay. However, let's change the, the colors. How would you show that temperature has increased? And how would you show that molecules strike harder because of that increase in temperature? It's the size of the arrow. The size of the arrow, AKA called the magnitude. I know you've heard that word several times. The magnitude, the size. So what you would do is show that the arrow is longer and that means that he has a lot of force that when he strikes the side of the container or maybe strikes another molecule that that arrow let me make that arrow bigger the arrow size represents that it's going to be a harder strike when it does strike that other molecule so if you see diagrams where there's small arrows and big arrows, it doesn't mean that that gas had to travel farther. That longer arrow has nothing to do with that. That means it's striking harder. So we represent that with what's called, like I said, those magnitude of arrows. Okay. So the five conditions for kinetic molecular theory. And when I say know this well, ladies and gentlemen, you know I, I mean know it well you will be given a set of questions of scenarios. If the gas is changed, is put in a container, and then that gas is transferred to a bigger container, what would happen if pressure was constant or if temperature was constant? You have to tell me all the scenarios. How did speed change? How did collisions change? How did they strike the walls of con container? So these right here are like the sample type of scenarios that you would see. It's not a one sentence kind of thing. It's the domino effect. You change pressure. Okay, this guy's going to change. And then this guy's going to change. And he's going to change in result to this one changing. It's you have to tell me each type. Okay. So use these two examples up here as a guide to the type of things that you would see. The five conditions for kinetic molecular theory and these five conditions tell us why gases behave the way that they do. So number one, gases are composed of molecules that are always in continuous motion and they always travel in straight lines and they change directions only when they collide with either molecules or side of the containers. So as you see like these arrows, okay, like this guy like right over here, he hit the wall of the container and then he bounced into a different direction. And that's what happens. Gases, they are so random that they go all over the place and no gas ever travels in the same path. Okay. Every gas is different. The pressure exerted by a gas in a container results from collisions and the more collisions, the more pressure. So between the gas molecules and the walls of the container, the magnitude of the size of those arrows, of the size of that pressure, is depended, uh, is determined by how often and how hard the molecules strike. So when I said those arrows, when you have a diagram with a small arrow versus a larger arrow, okay, this just means that the gas molecule striked harder with either that other gas or the container of the walls. Kinetic energy only corresponds to that temperature. Kinetic energy is directly proportional to that temperature, that Kelvin. If kinetic energy increases, temperature increases. But now what's the domino effect? Okay. If kinetic energy increases, temperature increases, now you have more movement. You have them traveling faster because of that increase and because you have more movement, you also have, do you know what else also changes? You also have more collisions. And that's the point of this whole theory is we want more collisions. Now these last two, this is when it gets a little tricky with this theory. Gas molecules are so negligibly small and I'm trying not to use two like fancy words for you, anything like that, ladies and gentlemen. Negligibly small means uh, hardly any effect. I mean, it is so small that it is barely noticeable. So the gas particles are so negligibly small compared with the distance between them 
that the volume of the gas molecules is assumed to be zero, negligible. And you're going to see something in 10.9 when we start comparing what a real gas is and a, an ideal gas. And unfortunately, with real gases, this is untrue. Okay, so this whole kinetic molecular theory, the whole point of this theory is relating it to an ideal gas. But unfortunately, aka ideal gases, but when you get to this conversation right here, and I'm going to go more into depth with it in 10.9, that the gas particles are so unbelievably small compared to the distance between them that the volume of the gases is assumed to be zero, negligible. They're saying basically they're barely there, okay? And we know that's not true because we got a lot of gases out there in the world. Here is another one that also is untrue for real gases, intermolecular forces. And usually when AP students, after they've had this chapter, hear those two words, they kind of cringe and they're like, oh my gosh, that, just, that, that's a, that, topic, that topic is just very tough. You're, that bad boy is coming next, chapter 11. So it's those forces between gas molecules, okay? So it's like this gas molecule, let's just say that's O2, and this gas molecule, which is N2, and we probably should be drawing them diatomic, the forces between them. Okay, sometimes that there's a force, and actually I'm going to keep them the same because I don't want you to think it's like a chemical reaction or something. So that force, that guy right there, that's called intermolecular forces. According to kinetic molecular theory, that force between gas molecules is so small that it's barely recognizable. So they say gas molecules not only don't attract and they don't repel each other or the sides of the container. And therefore, their collisions are what's called elastic, do not involve the loss or gain of energy. And we know that is so untrue, so untrue, because we do know gases have attractive forces to another gases. I mean, if they didn't, we wouldn't have some of the stuff that we have in this world today because of not because of those interactions, like mixtures and stuff like that. So according to this theory, ideally, it's like that, but they're saying these forces are so small that they barely are held anywhere close to each other. They have literally no connection to another oxygen molecule and to another oxygen and another oxygen. And we know that is so untrue because energy, you always lose and you always gain energy. But the law of conservation says it just got rearranged, okay? Unfortunately, this is another one, not so true. So to help you with this, ladies and gentlemen, Fairbra made a series of questions to help you with this, to analyze how temperature and energy and speed are related to each other. And I always show this graphical representation because your book has hardly anything in it besides one page. And it's called the Maxwell-Boltzmann Diagram. And I know that sounds familiar because it said it twice in the learning objectives. It provides a graphical representation of how energy, aka kinetic energy, velocities, speed, and temperature change. And AP loves this graph, okay? So this is the graph that I'm talking about right here. So if you go to Teams, it's right here. Go right here to where it says Fair Bras Videos, and it's around 37 minutes, like it's probably pretty much right there at the beginning of 37 minutes, and you're going to watch just about 5 to 10 minutes of it, okay? These are his questions, okay? And this graph right here, you're going to want to draw it because he's going to talk about the shaded area underneath it. So for those of you that have, are taking calculus or getting ready to take calculus, uh, this type of topic is usually talked about in calculus with chemistry, and it's a certain course in chemistry in college called physical chemistry, where we look at the area under the graphs. And I know for those of you, if you are in calculus, that sounds familiar to you because you've done those calculations in calculus. So right here under Fairbrow's video, about 37 minutes, and I didn't type that part uh, I put it right there in red because uh, I forgot to put that time in there. So you're going to answer these questions, 
okay, and draw that diagram in the notes and really, really put some notes about those diagrams, okay? So he has about two pages of questions. So here's my graph to you. According to this figure, which of these gases has the largest molar mass? According to these three lines, list them from smallest to largest, okay? So which gas is which, okay? with this graphical representation. See you on the next one.